Look, I first went to an auction way before I was in the real estate industry. They were quite bullish and quite aggressive. And I remember thinking, my gosh, I would hate to be sitting against them. I really just had this philosophy that it was going to be a very different experience. The people that had mentored me in my selling career were fantastic and they were all about the customer. Can you walk us through your process of negotiating purchase for your clients? Actually, it's a good time to plug the book again. No. <laughs> <laughs> The key to negotiation is knowledge. If you have the knowledge of what's going on with the market, where it sits in the market, you've conducted your due diligence and you know the motivation behind the sale, you've built yourself a whole armory of knowledge. The key for us, of course, is to be non-emotional. We're making sure that we are removing our clients from the emotion of the negotiation and just making sure that you don't try and be too smart, but with knowledge comes power and that allows you to get the transaction done. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The CG Show. With me here today, Nicole Jacobs, the founder and director of NJP Advocates, property expert on Channel 9's The Block. Nicole is empowering Australians to find property that's right for them. Nicole is a published author of the book Sold, a speaker, and she also contributes regularly to print media, talkback radio, your domain, Sky News and Sky Business News, Nicole, is there anything that you don't do? Like, have we missed out on anything at all? Uh, <laughs> let's see. I don't race fast cars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but everything else you got covered. I got covered, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. How are you? Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me on, Christian. The It's been an interesting time over, over the last 12 to 18 months, and I, I really, like, wanted to have a chat with you because I first – discovered you on the block and then obviously I started following your journey and I was like oh she seems so cool and then like well you'll make me laugh during email so I was like all right this is going to be a really good discussion so <laughs> I'm pumped so thank you and uh, give me a little bit of a background about how and why you got into real estate mm. okay so this is a great question because uh, I've had many life forms since I finished year 12 and took a gap year and went overseas. And so I finally got into real estate uh, just before 2000. So this is my 23rd year. And I got into real estate because I could no longer work in Australia. We moved to uh, San Francisco and I had the opportunity to really think about what it is that I wanted to do. And I realized that I really love people. So whatever I did had to be people orientated and I love property. So it was just a natural fit to learn more about that. And so in the States, I learned to buy and sell foreclosed properties. And then as soon as we got back to Australia uh, in 2000, uh, end of 2000, uh, I just thought, right, um, that's what I'm going to do. So I went and got my uh agent's representative, which was the first thing to do. And at the end of that course, the person that took the majority of the lectures offered me a job and it began from there. So as a that, selling agent, I must add. As uh, a okay, agent. that was going to be my next question because while you're telling me about you being in America, I'm like, okay, so that's how she was probably a buyer's advocate because back in when you probably got into it, even now it's still extremely niche. So I can't even imagine when you got into it, how how niche it was everyone was probably like what like what what are you how does it work so how did yeah. that even how did that even like happen and how did you or even how did you find your time as a selling agent to even make that change so i loved sales sales i was i could probably sell ice to the eskimos so sales was a really natural process for me and of course as i said i loved property um connecting with the people that we were selling for was really key um, and then I moved from one agency to another. And in that time, one of the directors said to me, look, could you have a look after the buyers, please? We've got, it was, it was a frenetic time in the market. Um, it was about 2006. And, and he just said, can you please, if the buyers come through the door, you can look after them. Um, if they want to buy off us, then we don't charge them. But if they want to buy from somebody else's, um, you know, listing, then we charge them. And I said, okay, great. Um, and I sat down with um, these three beautiful sisters and understood right there and then that this is what I wanted to do because all of a sudden I wasn't an estate agent. 
yeah. I was somebody that they really wanted to get information from and trusted. And I thought, wow, this is this is a really lovely side of the equation um, to be able to listen to what they wanted, listen to their budget, and then go and find it. Uh, I successfully purchased them a great uh, home in Elwood, and that that began my my start into um, into the buying world, which was you know fantastic. So my very first client. So I left that company. Um, I went and had a co- couple of kids, and um, and then opened up my own company within you know matter of months, and had a beautiful young couple that were living overseas at the time. I've now bought three properties for them. So it's no um, it's been great. It's really uh, something that I absolutely wake up and love to do. How did you even like, so when when you started, how how was the reception from, from you know, your potential clients? So you were like, oh, you know, you're obviously presenting your services. And back then, like even now, it's still not that big. I know it's, pretty it's pretty decently big in in sydney but in melbourne it's still very you know unknown it's it's getting out there but it's still a little bit unknown so back then what was it like it's funny your perception of it being quite unknown for me probably because it's on my radar is that every man and his dog is actually getting uh, into buyer advocacy so <laughs> it feels like they're everywhere but um uh, we'll we'll get back to that when we talk about quality but um I look, I first went to an auction way before I was in the real estate industry and, and observed um, an, an advocacy company then, and they were quite bullish and quite aggressive. And I remember thinking, my gosh, I would hate to be um, bidding against them. So when I got into it, I really just had this philosophy that it was going to be a very different experience. Um I had very, you know, the the people that had mentored me in my selling career were fantastic and they were all about the customer and that customer focus I had in previous jobs as well. And I just thought it's not rocket science, you know. Our industry is about communication. It's about getting back to people, listening, so important, and and then delivering and over-delivering, you know. So it's it, to me it, it just is natural um, and being able to buy for people and, you know, really see their dreams come true, whether, you know, like at the start it was a, a two-bedroom apartment and now I'm buying families big, beautiful homes. So it's, to me, I'm I'm absolutely privileged to do what I do. Nice. And for the viewers watching who aren't familiar with the process of using a buyer's agent, can you please explain to them how you go about engaging with one and the process? Absolutely. So you can easily Google buyer's agent Melbourne or something like that. But uh, my clients come through a referral base. So it's usually people that have used me or uh, know of me. Um, And so a buyer's agent, basically in very broad terms, is someone that actually is on your side to go and buy the property. So in my instance, we will uh, make the appointment, sit down and listen to the brief of the of the buyers. So that comes down to everything from how many bedrooms they want, how many bathrooms, whether they want off-street parking, do they have a favoured side of the street, do they want weatherboard, do they want brick, do they want modern, do they want architecturally significant from, you know, the 1900s or Victorian. Uh, And then obviously their suburb choices. And I like to refine that and give them three primary suburbs so that they're not looking at 10 suburbs because that's really difficult to get your head around. Even for someone that's in the game, 10 suburbs are very different. You know, when you have a look at pricing, if you have a look at, you know, one side of the street to the other, like it's very intricate. But sometimes the brief from a client is really just that it has to have that something. So that something is very, it, it's, it's not tangible at all. It, you know, it's intangible and, and it takes until you walk through the home and you go, ah, it's got that something. And then we get them in to have a look at it. So the, so the brief part is making sure that we can find the right property for our clients. Then it comes down to working out what price that property, you know, really where the value is. And then where the emotional value might be on that property. So it's being able to say to our clients, okay, we think it's worth X in the market at the moment, but we also know that it's in an amazing suburb, in a great street, 
Uh, it's got a really good floor plan and it's highly competitive. So when we go to auction or we're doing an expression of interest campaign to purchase that property, that we understand all of the nuances around that so that we can give our clients as much information as possible. So they feel really guided to make a really confident decision. Then, of course, we buy the property for them, whether it's at auction or a private negotiation, and see them all the way through to settlement and, uh, you know, walking through. And I've just this week been going back to quite a few of my clients' homes just to have a glass of champagne and just really sit there and hear their stories about why they love their homes. So it's a great, it's a great journey that I love to take. Nice, nice. And what qualities make a successful buyer's agent? I think with the same for selling agents and buyers agents is is the ability to listen and not actually think of yourself. <laughs> it's really important. So buyers agents really need to make sure that they're understanding the market, first of all, that when they hear a brief from a client and their budget, that they don't say it's achievable when it's maybe not. Um, the, and that, that comes from experience knowing that if you want a three bedroom, two bathroom home in say Elwood and you've got a budget of 800,000, it simply isn't going to work. Yeah, You're going to yeah. waste your clients a whole lot of time and money by going out there trying to find something that's not achievable. So it's um, it's understanding the market, it's understanding your clients and that's so important and being on their time frame, so not rushing them, not pushing them into something because at the end of the day, it's got to be right. And you make your money when you buy, so you need to make sure that you buy really well for them. What are some of the common misconceptions about the role of a buyer's agent? Oh, that it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think they can be a buyer's agent because they love looking at property. Yeah. It's like, okay. And their auntie twice removed cousin says they're good at it too. Yeah. So um... They're good at talking. I've heard that one. A yeah, correct. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, you know, it it takes to be a really good advocate. It takes time to get to know all of the local agents as well because quite often they tell you more than they'll tell anybody else. Um, you'll hear about properties before anybody else because you've got a professional relationship with them. And that, you know, back to understanding your client. If you don't understand your client, then you really are, you know, out there just prodding in the dark trying to find something for them. Yeah, it's um, it can always get it can always get interesting. Uh, especially, do you get I don't know sometimes um, some some clients that have had I don't know interesting experience with 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 other buyers advocates, which I'm probably sure you have. And if so, is there any I don't know is there is there anything in particular? Is there mistakes? I know you you said one in regards to making sure that, uh, you know, that it not just agreeing on if they want to, if that's their price, 800,000 for a two, three, three better, it's not possible. Is there anything else like other mistakes that you find um, other buyers advocates are making? I think some advocates try and rush the process and they try and make a square peg fit in a round hole, for instance. So, and I think that comes from not understanding that if their client said, I want a proper laundry and not a Euro laundry or a laundry in the bathroom. I want a proper laundry, you know, and if that property doesn't have it or have the ability to put it in, that's not their home. Or if the client says, I must have a garage and you're going, well, it's got off street parking. Yeah. But it's not a garage. Now, if they can't put a garage in because you've done your due diligence and you've checked that the council won't allow it, why are you pushing it on those clients, you know? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, the the buyer advocates that try and work to their agenda as opposed to their clients, I think, are the ones that won't last. They'll get frustrated. Um, or they're going to give the industry a bad name because they've actually done the wrong thing by the client. You talk about like this sparkle, this this feeling, or whatever whatever it is that you know a certain buyer is looking for, and, and it, it's not tangible. I think the words that you used, or, or whatever it was, how, um, yeah, how do you how do you decipher like what that is, or like how do you even break that down? I think the key is knowing your clients really well too, um, and understanding what really good property is. 
So we had clients that um, I'd been working with for quite some time. I'd already bought them a beautiful property and then the next property was their big dream home. And they had the brief of it's got to have that something. And we would walk through properties together and we'd all look at each other and go, yeah, nah, hasn't got it. It might have the most amazing rooms and it might have everything that they've asked to be ticked, but it just didn't have that something. And it's understanding what that is. I mean, it just is very difficult, but you almost get shivers when you walk in and go, oh, my gosh this is it. And I remember when we walked through, I walked through this property before them and I was like, oh yeah, this has got that something because I could just tell they could make it theirs. And I brought them back to it and I let them go in and I was behind them and I could just see them go, ah. And they looked at me and I'm like, yeah, (laughs) this is it. And I said, okay, let's not tell that agent. (laughs) And we bought it, you know, and I think that that was just such a great example of just making sure. I mean, we looked at probably 20 homes prior to that that ticked every box except for that something. And you know what? They had the trust in me to to that I was going to find it. I did not get distressed when they said no after no after no. It was about refining that brief and understanding that little bit more. Okay, what are the kids up to now? You know, this took 18 months to find this something. So during that time, you know, kids' birthdays and, you know, school changes and all that sort of thing um, led us to the most amazing home for them. So I couldn't be happier. It's like um, when I when I purchased uh, my first home with my partner, we it's it was we kind of just walked in like we were looking for for about six to nine months and um, I, remember, I remember my partner she was telling me she's like you're a real estate agent and you haven't even been able to find the right one I'm like we're gonna get there Nicole because it's her name yeah. Nicole as well I'm like, we're gonna get- <laughs> I like her already <laughs> yeah. I'm like we're gonna get there and then um yeah it was just like it was just this feeling um that we just kind of walked in and we looked at each other and we're like yeah this is like this is yeah. it. Um, so it's you know uh, it, yeah. and I haven't. I've never been able to really uh, d- describe it. I think it's just li- literally what you said. So it's it's funny. Like every time now, even when I'm dealing with buyers, you know, I just look at them like, well, if it's you know, what, how do you feel when it walks in? Then I just kind of play on that um, mm-hmm. in a sense because um, it, it really is. It's just this. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I can't describe it, but it is just this feeling that you just kind of get, and you're like, okay. Like this is it, so yeah, yeah inter- interesting. And um, uh, what are like some of the most common challenges you face as a buyer's agent, and how do you overcome them? Well, at the moment in this market is lack of stock, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that's incredibly frustrating because you have clients that have sold already and they need to buy. Um, but the biggest thing you can do for your client is just let them know that if the right one's not there at the moment, then they may need to rent, which is a challenge in itself because we know rentals are also difficult to come by. Yeah. Um, but it's keeping them on the on the path of that journey to find the right property and not just settling for something because it's there and they need it by that time because that's a lot of money you're spending. Um, even if someone was only spending half a million, that's half a million that they've saved and and really tried hard to you know um be able to afford a property so when your clients are spending upwards of four million five million ten million or more it's a lot of money to make a big mistake so um the challenge at the moment is lack of stock overcoming that challenge is being able to identify homes using back data um to to uncover homes that maybe aren't on the market at the moment um maybe properties that were on the market 12 months ago or more and they didn't sell, do they still want to sell? You know, reaching out to the agents regularly because quite often they've got so many buyers that they're handling and even though we like to think we're special, they forget, you know, and so ringing them, you know, every few days say, hey, what have you got? Have you listened to anything? Don't forget about my clients when you're going into this Um, or pitching for the business. So, um, and I think that that is, you know, one way of overcoming it is just trying to relax your clients, give them options, but also in the background be just trying to discover as many, you know, options for them as far as uncovering properties. Can you walk us through your process of negotiating, you know, a purchase for your clients? 
Yes. So actually, it's a good time to plug the book again. No, it's <laughs> all in the book. <laughs> um, so negotiation, well, the key to negotiation is knowledge. So if you have the knowledge of what's going on with the market, where it sits in the market, uh, you've conducted your due diligence, such as building and pest inspection, so you know exactly what needs to be done to the property and you know the motivation behind the sale and then you also know how many competitors you might have. You've built yourself a whole armory of knowledge. So you can go in there and negotiate. The key for us, of course, is to be non-emotional. You know, we're, we're making sure that we are removing our clients from the emotion of the of the negotiation and we're there as their professionals. And, you know, we negotiate weekly with selling agents who probably negotiate, you know, <laughs> a little bit more than weekly because, uh, you know, they've got so many more listings and uh, and just making sure that, you know, you don't try and be too smart, but with knowledge comes power and that allows you to get the transaction done. You know, a little bit of a win-win on both sides is always good. Or for to leave the transaction where they they everyone feels like they got a win, even though your clients are doing handstands and cartwheels because they're so excited they got it for less than what they thought. It's really good to have that, you know, um, you know, just professionalism when you're negotiating. Of course. And how do you stay up to date, you know, with market trends and changes that may affect your clients? Well, you live and breathe it 24-7. I don't think you can stop. Uh, and it's reading as well. You know, I love getting out just to to talk about the mark with agents in the areas that I'm looking at the time um, because they, of course, they're seeing so many more buyers. The, you know, they're also reading articles. I love reading the Fin Review. Um, I love reading The Age. Obviously, Domain's a big part. Um you know, online articles, it's really, you know, key is just talking to people. I try and make sure that I catch up with bankers, uh, brokers, solicitors, you know, it's everybody has something they can give you. Are you seeing many contracts coming across your desk? How many people are asking for loans at the moment? How many people are coming off fixed term loans? Do you think that you're going to have stress with your clients? You know, bankers, you're going to all these big meetings, the, the big financial forecasters, what are they saying? You know, so it's really important to arm yourself. And what I've learned though over the years is that even the big financial forecasters um, don't always get it right. But you know, having as much information as possible, as I said before, even when you're not negotiating is, you know, it gives you a lot of power. Do you have like a, I don't know, like a go-to YouTube page or like a, a go-to a go-to publisher or anything that, anything in particular that buyers could potentially maybe like dig their teeth in uh, from time to time? Well, that's a good question. I probably would for my clients it's the fin review because the fin review is talking about all the movers and shakers and what what property is selling uh who's doing what so if you know that for instance you know a big company is moving to melbourne well I, then i know that i need to speak to the hr manager you know um how many how many of the big executives need homes for instance um so for my clients to read those sections uh, they're in that market anyway they know those people so it's just you know i don't even have to tell them to read it because they read it um other advocates will just be across you know everything's online these days have subscriptions i have one to you know um the fairfax subscriptions you know it's it's just really important just to be as well read as possible um you know just even you spend half an hour a day just flicking through the media that's important how do you like decipher even with what you're reading because you'd obviously be uh well you know a bit more educated in this in this uh category of real estate but for for a buyer that that's just I don't know, looking, looking, trying to get their head around what's going on. How do you decipher what what they should be following and what what not? Because there is a lot of information out there. Absolutely. So the biggest key I talk about when I, when I speak with people or just have a coffee with people is that, you know, there are micro markets. Okay. So if you just took the headlines from the newspapers, you could think everything's doom and gloom, or you could think that the market's on the way down, the market's on the way up, the market's stable, whatever it is, there are micro markets. So within those, the, the big market, you know, if you're looking at properties in different um, price points, for instance, the competition is different. 
what's happening in those markets is different. It's like you buying in the north and I'm buying in, say, Stonington or Bayside. Those markets operate very differently. Yes, there's the key things that always happen, but they, you know, they they are so different. Um, so it's important that if you're starting out this journey and you're not using an advocate, then you need to submerge yourself in your micro markets. You need to make sure that you're going to auctions. Watch what they do. How do they operate? You know, are they referral auctions? Are they non-referral auctions? Um, you know, you'll get to see people in your price bracket that are bidding. Watch them. Take down. Do they? Do they? Does the pregnant lady always stop at a certain price? Does the the young guy with the leather jacket? Oh, I've seen him a few times. What time? You know, where does he go? Oh, he's got a budget of one point six because he always pulls out there. Or, you know, I mean, this is intelligence that you you can't read. You've just got to get there and and watch oh, it nice. and observe. You know, who's bought their mum and dad as well? They're serious. You know. Um, Watch the nuances of people shaking their heads um, and then, you know, and pulling out from bidding. So it's emerging yourself in the micro market that you want to buy in. You get to know it better than anybody else because you're watching it. You're going to the auctions. You're going to the opens. You know why one sold for more than the other. Um, it was better finished or it had a better floor plan or it was on a better, you know, uh, sighting. It had a north rear yard, for instance. The other one was south. One was weatherboard. One was brick. You know, y- you get to be the champion of your micro market and then that is the market. You're talking to the agents, you know, how many people do you think you've got on this one? Like, don't be afraid to communicate with the agents. They love it. You know, at the end of the day, we're all actors, aren't we? We love it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're performing every day, you know. So, you know, the ability to talk about what we do, I, I don't know what agent wouldn't want to. <laughs> I think uh, agents, we, we get excited when uh, we've got a buyer's advocate interested in our properties. You do, uh, because you know we're not emotional and you know they're real. <laughs> yeah. And 100%. the most deal will be done if it's right for the client and if the price is, you know. 100%. And uh, the buyer's advocates, mate, you guys are ruthless. <laughs> you guys are ruthless coming through. So it's, um, no, it's brilliant. And uh, what, It's a non-emotional what's... side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what sets you apart from other buyer's advocates in the industry? And how do you continue to provide value to your clients? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, look, I'd like to think that I I set myself apart because I take on a handful of clients only at a time, uh, which means that I can give them the utmost of you know service as far as you know being able to communicate regularly with them uh, and being able to find the properties for them that may be the needle in a haystack. Uh, I don't pressure my clients, but I do let them know when I think it's good buying. And if it's right for them, then we go for it and we will we will absolutely acquire it for them. Um, it's not always about price. It's about sometimes with our clients, it's about making sure that they get it because that home is not going to come up for another 30 or 40 years. So, uh, you know, communicating, being respectful of the industry we work within, I think they're really key uh, and I, I, you know, they're the things that I live by, being real, you know, not trying to be someone else. Can you sh- share a success story of a particular challenging purchase you facilitated for a client? Uh, look, I'll probably, I'll just share one that happened recently because that's probably the most relevant, but it, it came down to emotion. My clients that flew in from interstate and, they were highly charged and emotional to buy something in Melbourne because they're moving here. And uh, we 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 went through a f- quite a, a handful of properties. I lived with them basically for four days and uh, we looked at several properties and they wanted to put in offers on virtually everything they saw. So the challenge was making sure that it was right, even though they were telling me it was right. I really had to dig deep into how they wanted to live, what they wanted to do, how long they were going to hold it for, um, why they liked that suburb. And I think in the end, the one that we got, uh, they wanted to make an offer before the auction. And I just said, look, my advice is we don't go prior to auction. In this market, I think there's a lot of buyer hesitancy. And they said, but we don't want to miss it. And I said, you will not miss it. I will acquire it for you. 
I just feel that if we wait to auction, we're going to actually save you a lot of money. And sure enough, you know, even though the agent said we had three to four uh, competitors, no one else bid. Yeah. <laughs> they passed into us. I said to them when we walked in, this is how it's going to go. They're going to tell us some ridiculous price up here. We're going to shake our heads and say no. And then the negotiation starts. And she said, that's okay. Just give them that. I said, no, 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 no. That's where you've got me. Yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, the agents came in who I, I really, I adore them. They're, they're a great agency and, and you know, we, we do a lot of deals together. But um, sure enough, they gave us the, the ridiculous price. They walked off and my client said, oh, just pay it. We'll, we'll take it. And I said, no, 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 no. This is what we're going to do. So we just went back and forth, back and forth, and we ended up buying it right at the bottom of the quote range. Uh, we came up slightly from what we bid at auction, and we saved them 600000 You know, wow. now, nice. that's a lot of money. So <laughs> she was very, very excited, and it meant that the little, you know, cosmetic changes that she wanted to do, she could start straight away. So their journey and uh, their life in Melbourne is going to be, it's going to start off really well. Nice, nice. And the, my next question was going to be like, what's the biggest benefit of working with a buyer's agent, you know, as, a, as opposed to just doing it themselves? Now, that's a huge saving right there, number one. <laughs> the savings is definitely there. But as I said, sometimes it's not the saving, it's the acquiring because they maybe – Thought. I get I get people coming to me because they've missed out on properties and they've missed out because they either didn't believe the selling agent who might have been telling them the truth. Yeah. Uh, they didn't like the games and and they just didn't understand where they needed to be to be successful. So being able to represent a, a client and give them all that information um, and know that the agent's not going to sell it unless, like my job is to make sure they don't sell it before they come back to me. If they're going to sell early, I want to know about it. Um, the games they play, well, there's less games when you're an advocate because I'm sure you understand, you know, when you're dealing with ab advocates, it's just a very different process. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's really important that, um, that, you know, that's what we bring to the table. Is there a time where, I don't know, you had to, you had to deliver difficult news um, to a client uh, due to, I don't know, there could have been a whole range of situations in a deal, could have been a long negotiation that went pear-shaped for a random reason or, or anything specific that comes to mind when I ask that question? or uh, Not many, <laughs> um, but I do remember one client really falling in love with a property and we got the building and pest inspection done. And we don't get this very often, but the building and pest inspector just said, you need to run as fast as you can because half the house is sinking and so they were devastated because you know as a buyer you you see the property you love it you start moving your furniture in you've already you know started your life living in it virtually and then you get told oh actually we're gonna have to spend a whole lot of money to get this property back up to where it should be and it's actually not a healthy property it's you know it's sinking there's rising damp all those sorts of things so that would probably be a, a time when a client was sad, but at the same time thankful that we'd done the building and pest. We we don't tend to buy anything without a building and pest because it just may not stop you from buying something, but it allows you to go into that transaction with your eyes wide open, knowing yeah, exactly the health of that property. Hundred percent. How are you finding the the market at the moment? Obviously, low stock levels, but generally, like, what are you seeing price wise, and um, how do you see obviously the next I don't know six to twelve months playing out? Yeah, again, a really good question. So, of course, as we've discussed, low stock levels. So the the supply and demand cycle is completely out of whack. Uh, okay. But what I'm seeing is that property that is done finished, walk in, turn the kettle on, send out your invites to say, hey, I've just bought something, yeah. come over for the housewarming, they're doing well because yeah. nobody wants to factor in a renovation or a rebuild. So the properties that are doing really well are achieving multiple bidders and you could be forgiven thinking that the market is not the market when you go to those auctions or you hear about the results because those properties are selling themselves because they've got multiple um, buyers on them. So they're selling really well. 
Do you find, um, I don't know, is there a specific method in this market that, uh, I don't know, this is more maybe just a, just a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a, a bit of a hint for maybe age selling agents. Is there something better? Do you find the private sale method is particularly better in this market or, or the auction method or does it depend on the property overall? How are you seeing it? Uh, again, in my market, there are a lot of expression of interest campaigns and the reason is that that protects the seller because they don't, no one else really knows what the property has been given in that expression of interest campaign. So you might have nobody offering. You may have a couple of people and they're so vastly different. One's up here, one's down here, and nobody knows that. The buyers don't know it. One's, one wins because they're up here and the other one goes, oh. And if they were at auction, then they may only have just gone a little bit more because, you know, at auction, it's a the most transparent way to buy a property. So for me as an advocate, I love auctions because it's an opportunity to dominate. It's an opportunity to bear smiling assassin and scare people um, <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Yeah. Um, but that, again, that comes from knowledge of the market and where this property sits. A lot of people go, oh, that was expensive. And then they realize later, oh, actually, that was good buying because I didn't realize it was probably worth that. Um, and so auctions for me is the best way for my clients to understand that that's where their competition is. So if we're paying, you know, 5000 more than the last bidder, happy days. But if we go into an EOI or we go into what I don't like is best offer. Yeah. Best offer is, you know, it, it's just not transparent for the client. Um, and quite often they won't come back to you. My job as an advocate though, is to make sure they do come back to me. <laughs> yeah. But At the end of the day, you have to educate your client and let them know that we need to go in with the, the best you know, offer where they're happy to walk away if they don't get it. Are you, what are you seeing in the market? Like, are you seeing distressed sales? Obviously, 11, 11 interest rate rises. And mm. if you turn on the media there, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the market. Um, or doom and gloom. I think I think they've, they're starting to flip the narrative, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't checked in the last month, but I, I probably should. But, um, yeah, what, what, are you, what are you kind of seeing in, in that perspective? And what do you, what do you believe – um is is going to happen are we going to pause interest rates in the next one and then another leg up in the market or i know i'm not going to hold you to uh, uh to any of this it's just an opinion and what you see but yeah what are your thoughts on all that let me just get my crystal ball yeah <laughs> <laughs> just what's it saying what's it say? the crystal ball says well yeah. just a great, um pause i think there's got to be interest rate stress. I'm starting to see properties that were bought during the pandemic coming back onto the market for less than what they sold for, hoping that with competition they go slightly above and so they can cover their costs. I think that's that's probably what I've seen the most of. Um, anything bought prior to the pandemic or well, they haven't that they've bought well purely because the market rose significantly before um they'd bought i mean sorry after they'd bought um i think that you know you touched on something there the narrative is changing and one thing is that we are our markets whether we're selling agents or buyer agents so our market that we all play in is so highly dependent on the media we are so influenced by the media because those big headlines influence the the market that we all work in and we all play in so um if the narrative changes um we tend to see that instantly and then the lag from everything else what's the advice that you have for buyers uh in this current market i always have the advice that if it's the right property and you can afford it buy it the biggest problem a lot of people face is that they the hesitancy is there so that that's that unknown do i put my property on the market to sell do i buy now do i wait for the bottom of the market waiting for the bottom of the market is fraught with danger because you can only ever see it once it's gone so don't try and time the market is my biggest advice if the property is right for you and you can afford it go for it 
factor in, you know, the bank or your your um, financial institution are going to factor in rate rises and they're going to make sure that you can repay. Don't over don't overcommit yourself, especially if you you think I might want to change jobs in six months. Um, I think or have a family, um, but I think just don't try and time the market is my biggest advice. Nice. And uh, do you have some advice for buyers advocates looking to potentially or someone looking to become a buyers advocate or or maybe someone that's uh, new in the industry? Mm. So I think you should always try and work with people that are very good in the industry because just that natural absorption of the conversation, you, you just you sort of goes in and you know, your mind meld. Um, I think become as qualified as possible. I think it's really important to get the qualifications, but also to work and earn your stripes. Just because you've bought and sold a few properties yourself doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be amazing at handling someone else's asset. And I think you need to understand that it is a privilege to do what we do. We're handling, in most cases, somebody's biggest asset that they will ever purchase or sell. So it's so important that you you actually understand that, you know. This is, for some people, you know, this is going to set them up for life or it's going to ruin them. So, you know, understanding that, it's just crucial. What are some of the biggest lessons uh, or that you learned uh, potentially when you, uh, over your years as a, as a buyer's advocate? The first one I learned was that um, when I first started out, I can't believe I did this. I used to, if the client wasn't available at the auction, I would sign myself and or nominee until an, <laughs> a solicitor said to me, uh, you do realise that if they don't buy it, if they pull out, um, you've just bought yourself a property. And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> like this is way back when, right? And I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. hmm, I better start using um, limited power of attorneys. <laughs> yes. I started, uh, I changed completely and made sure that I was never signing for a client Personally, I can sign now as a, as a power of attorney. So nice. <laughs> that was my nice. biggest. Yeah, well, that's so a lucky step there. That, <laughs> yeah, if you're doing that out there, do not do it because <laughs> if something happens, you've just bought yourself a home and hopefully you bought a really good one. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Um, you know, it's just key to be organised. You know, you need to make sure that you've got a good filing system, that you're um, able to, you know, make sure that you're touching base with every client that you've got. Um, the one thing we haven't touched on is probably social media and marketing yourself. So I think in today's world, it's, you know, social media is really important, but at the end of the day, it's got to be real. You know, you can't just put something out like every other agent does. It's got to be, you know, um, I don't know, just lift yourself to a different level, you know. Yeah. You you should be publishing your successes um, because that's how people gain confidence in what you do, but um, make sure that you have that balance between your life and your professional life. And yeah. I have two social pages. One is my own Nicole Jacobs private and one is Nicole Jacobs property, which is my Instagram handle. Um, and that is about work. And very rarely will you see something about myself or my family doing something, you know, like who really wants to see me having a picnic, you know. Yeah, exactly. um, but, you know, for for family members that are overseas or interstate, this, the Nicole Jacobs or my Nick Jacobs one, which is personal, is, um, you know, it's for them so that they can see what the kids are doing. How do you find trying to balance uh, two Instagram pages? Because um i see like do, do you struggle with it because i see sometimes that they they you know they tend to lack on one side or, or the other um but you, how do you feel about it all yeah social media is very difficult and yeah. i'm not great at it i'm the first to admit that i'm not a great social media expert and for me to post um it it, it it's difficult. Yeah. I, I'm uh, hands up. Yeah. Um, 
balance is the two well i don't i don't post much um i i used to post a lot and now i've really pulled back because um one i'm incredibly busy but two it's um i i always hesitate now and go does, does someone really need to see that yeah i don't know if they do yeah um <laughs> So I try and keep my page inspirational and aspirational. Nice. So I, you know, the privilege I have of going through some amazing homes uh, is what I like to share. Um, and But I'm always worried about quality too. So if I've done a video and I think, ah, the lighting wasn't right or whatever, I don't tend to post. Um, but, you know, maybe I need to live a little and and do a little more that <laughs> and not worry so much about the quality and and just get it up there yeah it's uh sometimes uh it it really depends maybe you're nitpicking on little things it's probably an yeah. amazing video nicole <laughs> all right the next one i post if it's really bad let me dm me <laughs> yeah <laughs> done done I'll, I'll definitely keep you in the loop on that and thank um, you how, how do you find even with your social media like do you, do, you, do you generate do you generate business through it? Like, do people hit you up um, for buyer's advocacy work? Yeah, so I do buyer advocacy as well as vendor advocacy. And, yeah, I do. Uh, most of my work, though, is referral. So it's someone no. that's used me or knows of me through someone nice. that's used me. <laughs> so nice. yeah. um, but social media, I definitely get people contacting me. Um, my webpage is, you know, generates a lot of people. I used to have a shop front, but I would say out of the five years of the shop front I had, um, probably three walked off the street. Yeah. Everybody else was someone that knew me. Yeah, always, always online. I, I think there was, um, I, started, I started probably jumping on social media as an agent back in 2015, 2016. And uh, then it was like, it was one of those things where, no, I don't think there were many, um, there, were, there were many uh, posting and it was always a, a situation where they would say, oh, you know, you couldn't generate a lot of business through it. And then I think now it's become a thing where people, are, they're starting, like everyone's starting to go um, pretty hard. But I think, as you said, everyone's like kind of posting the same thing. Like there's no... Yeah real value that that they provide like that I not everybody like a, but just just generally and um but yeah I think it's I think it's a, I think it's a cool tool and if if you you just add that on to everything else you do it's just mm. it doesn't it might give you a few leads here and there and uh yeah. you keep punching <laughs> well sometimes it's not about the leads it's just about the profile so that people know you're still alive yeah. <laughs> and they're still oh, doing yeah. stuff <laughs> yeah I think um potentially as well I, I believe that, you know, our, I'll just talk as a real estate agent, our vendors before they're choosing us will probably search us up and, and, and probably jump on our profiles and stuff. So it could be used as a bit of a resume as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, yeah. And how do you, you said you're extremely busy. So how do you balance your workload and just in, ensure that all your clients receive the attention they deserve? Well, as I said before, I don't like to take on more than, uh, you know, a handful of clients. So five or six, probably okay. eight is my maximum at any okay. one time. Um, the sweet but, spot. Sorry. Yeah, the sweet the, spot is yeah. five. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, it's just being organized and making sure that everybody's brief is different. So I don't take on conflicting briefs as far as um, our clients go. People will wait. Um, if they've got the same brief or they know that if they've got a similar brief um, and budget that the person who signed first is the one that will receive the, receive the properties first, um, which I'm just very open and transparent if that's the case. Um, it, it happens very rarely because it's very rare that someone wants exactly the same home with the same budget in the same yeah. suburb. Um so it's being organized. It's making sure that your day is efficient. So phone calls, uh, looking at properties. I'll discount a lot of properties just from asking a lot of questions. So if they're off market and there's no photos, um, I will discount a lot of them just by the right questions to that agent. Um, I'll do drive-bys. So I'll look at anything I can that gives me a floor plan that could be up to date. Um, 
and, you know, just making sure that I like to get through properties when not everybody's going through because then I can really have a look. So I see a lot of my my properties during the week instead of the weekend. And then Saturday is, is a great time to be able to go out. You know, it's game day for most agents, isn't it? And yeah. you're either bidding at auctions or you're uh, observing auctions because for me, it's like that when I was talking about the micro markets is making sure that I'm in a market may not be a property I want to buy, but if it's in the market that I'm looking at for clients, then I'm going to be there and watch what's going on. What are, you, what are you What are you finding with all like a lot of the off market properties that agents are, are throwing at you? Uh, are they generally over overpriced, and a lot of people are just kind of having a swing? Like, what are you finding? <laughs> oh, it's such a good question. I said to somebody yesterday. The off-market market, well, everybody wants to know if that's what the buyer's ever can, can bring as opposed to everything that's on market. Um, it Quite often, it's overpriced, and that's the reason it's off-market. You speak to the agent, or I can speak to the agent and say, are you kidding me? And they'll be yeah. like, it's all right. We'll run this for two or three weeks. Then we'll let them know. You know, we'll give them the feedback, and then we'll go to campaign. So... An off market is only as good as, uh, you know, first of all, right house or property, um, and then second is that the the price is also okay, because if it's overpriced, then you know, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> what role do you see technology playing in the future of the buyer's agent industry? Is there anything in particular that you're seeing? I know there's, there's like a it's like a platform like Listing Loop. I think that you can. Um, that you can put your properties on there, and um, there's a few of these that have started to pop up and and stuff like that. But what are your what's your opinion? There's artificial intelligence that's like starting to make waves, and there's all this stuff happening, and there's a yeah. lot of noise. Uh, a lot of noise. I think we're already doing a fair bit, like virtual tours, or or actually, you know, just tours on the end of you know the phone for international clients. Um, I think the uh, it's a really good question because I'm actually not that great at technology. <laughs> Anyone out there that wants to give me a call um, about technology and how I can use it better. Um, but I think that, um, you know, you know what, I, I think that technology is only as good as um people being able to use it correctly, but also targeting. So, um, you know, there's a lot of platforms out there that, are, you know, try and help you get listings and all those sorts of things. Um, but I think, you know, digital is the is the way of the future. We don't have to have real offices. We don't have to produce brochures. Uh, there are lots of things we can do digitally that um, – make more sense they're faster uh they're more efficient cost wise for for clients um and you know the ability to be able to show someone on the other side of the world what a property looks like um is already happening so does that does that tick the box for technology yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i i i'm, I'm curious because even like uh, i've been i don't know like we've started with the iteration of um of you know just showing someone through a phone and I was watching something the other day. Um, it's the American real estate agents, like they're trying. They were talking about how, like, if virt when virtual reality becomes a thing, who knows? Could be ten years time or whatever it is. But think about it: how you'd be able to just like enter. You'd put these goggles on. You'd be able to enter a property, and yeah. no matter where you are around the world, you'd be able to just walk around the property and look mm -hmm. at it. And it's open twenty four seven. And I think we yeah we would transact at a much faster rate. So. I don't know. I I was just, they're already doing that, aren't they? Yeah, are they, doing they, they that? are. But it's just, yeah. it's not, um, you know, it's not very, you know, the consumers aren't, you know, we're, we're not sitting there with our goggles on the side and just uh, <laughs> kind of chucking it on and running with it. So I don't know. I was, uh, I was, I was just throwing the rod out there just to see if you've, uh, I don't know, you've heard something or seen something that, that, okay, uh, I am going to brush up on technology so yeah. that next time we speak, <laughs> I am on the ball. Yes, yes, I'm definitely going to be asking you, what do you got for me, Nicole? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> but the, what do you love about working as a buyer's agent? Uh, just the human interaction. You know, I really, really love finding someone, something where I know they're going to just love it. You know, and I think I said right at the start this week, 
and last week I've just spent time going back to clients' homes where they've either finished their renovation or they've just moved in and they're settled and they've got their artwork up and just sitting back with them and just saying, are you happy? And just hearing their stories of what they love about their new home just gives me just that little tingle of, oh my God, I'm a part of this. You know, quite often I think, oh, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not, you know, um, saving the world. But, it, it, you know, sometimes I save marriages. Absolutely. You know, just getting them both on the same page um, and just letting them, you know, give me their story. And, and just, again, it comes back to that privilege of being led into somebody else's life. And I love that you know, that they trust me to be able to keep their information confidential um, but to still forge a really beautiful relationship with them where I see them years years later. No, I say, I always say it like on, on my end when, you know, when I'm dealing with buyers, I like to look at it as just shopping with friends. You know, I want to I want to walk in and, and just shop with them and obviously <laughs> if it's the right home, then that's amazing. We can, we can get a deal done but you know, I, I, I tend, I, I, don't, I don't, if I try to sell a property, we do obviously buy work, but, you know, I get paid for, for selling it. So but I think it's, it, I think it, I go in with that mentality and, and it, it helps, it helps a lot. Um, you try and you build a good relationship with them. We're all humans. Um, Absolutely. So and it's, and it's the game. It's the game we play. If we can connect on a, on a good level, then, um, you know, it, it always, it always helps. And what, what drives you? Uh, what drives me is to be the best I can be um, and to be really authentic and real. I know that those words are bandied around a lot, but I think it's so important that um, I can be the best role model for our three daughters and that they can see that running your own business is it's big, but it's it's also very achievable and that there's nothing... I can't do if I put my my head to it and decide I'm going to do it. And I think that that drives me. My three amazing kids drive me. I've got the most amazing husband that's in my corner that uh, just supports me um, and is a big believer of women in business. So I'm really blessed to have that. And I've got a great mum who has always taught me that the customer is number one you know, and that they're there because of you. But, you know, I used to be a checkout chick and I remember not wanting to go one day um, to do my, you know, checkout checking at at, uh, Woolworths. And she said, but you as the checkout operator, that's the most important job there. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, if you give them a great experience, you're the last person they see and they'll come back. And that is worth more to the company than anything because it's a lot more expensive to bring people in than it is to retain. And I remember thinking, oh. And so I went there and then she said to me later, she goes, oh, I watched you. She said, you love what you do. (laughs) What I do. Once I get there, I'm, you know, I know I might just be putting groceries through, but I hear their stories. I get my regulars and and I realized then that she is so right, so on the ball that it's all about customer service. And that's why you're amazing what you do, Nicole. That's that's actually really good. That's really good. To, it's interesting because um, yeah, I, I like that one. I and now you look at it, we go into we go into supermarkets and unfortunately we're starting to get bloody replaced by those bloody machines. I know. It's like, <laughs> but it's so it's so true, and it it's obviously sets you up um with what with what you've done and with your um, with with your children, uh, any of them? I'm not too sure if if they're over 18 or anything. But are any of them going to be entering the uh, uh, your business with you, or are they all going separate paths? I'm not sure. That door is always open for them. Uh, we have two. We have twins that are 17 and one that's 14, nearly 15 next week nice. or the week after, and uh, all three girls have incredibly strong wills and minds and uh, whatever they want to do, uh, we'll support them. Um, They're very creative um, and very business savvy. We've tried to teach them business skills from very early age. So uh, the the door will always be open to the family business. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's so cool. That's really cool. Okay, three, three more Jacobs running buys have to get yeah, to running imagine. through the market. Wow. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> yeah, it'd be wild. Oh, that's that's amazing to hear. And Nicole, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out to speak with me and provide provide value uh to the audience. Um, and I'm sure I'll be seeing you very soon. Oh, thank you, Christian. I look forward to seeing you very soon too. <laughs> it's uh exciting times ahead, and uh yeah, as I said, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, where could people find you? All right. So Instagram is probably the best one. And my handle is at Nicole Jacobs Property. Uh, website is NicoleJacobs.com. So it's all very easy. Everything's Nicole Jacobs. Just Google Nicole Jacobs. Nicole Jacobs, okay. everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> everything. Oh, that's amazing. And Nicole, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate it. And you have a really good day. Thanks, Christian. You too. Bye-bye.